I discovered that ending a marriage is not as simple as closing the door. Of course, I made a decision and knew it was the right one because I understood that I could not live with the lifestyle that Megan wanted. But even though I smugly announced to Megan and Teresa that the marriage was over, I had a very difficult time adjusting to the situation. All the time, all the emotion, and all the effort I had put into my five-year marriage had been in vain, and I couldn't shake the feeling that every moment of happiness I had with Megan was either a lie or tainted by her actions. It seemed like everything I did and everywhere I went reminded me of Megan and happier times. I found myself leaving the restaurant without finishing my meal because my dish was the same one I ordered the night I asked her to marry me. The tulips blooming next door were a painful reminder that they were her favorite flowers. Labrador is her favorite dog. Rock is her favorite music. Vanilla is her favorite smell. Sunny days reminded me of days spent outside, hiking, gardening, or just taking a walk. If it rained, I remembered lazy days by the fireplace, snuggled in a blanket, slowly giving in to the urge to make love. It became impossible for me to sleep in our bed, eat at our table, or even live in our duplex. And eventually I had to move out of our house entirely. Honestly, I was completely miserable, and I wanted to believe that she felt the same loneliness and loss that I did and that she would at least express some kind of regret. The marriage was over, I knew it and I knew it was my decision, but I desperately wanted some sign, some signal, that she cared about our relationship and that, on some level, she deeply regretted her choice. Unfortunately, other than a few half-hearted attempts to get me to change my mind, she had essentially given up, and it was clear that she was more than willing to quietly leave our marriage. I knew it was probably easier for her because she had a lover, someone she could be with, who dulled the pain and made it easier for her to move on. It seemed unfair to me that Megan continued to live with half of what her life had become while I was left without something of mine, especially since the half she had included something new and apparently exciting. Although I did not and could not know everything she did that summer before the divorce was finalized, I knew that about she spent most of her free time with Palmer and Teresa and their group. He also knew that she had gone on vacation with him at least twice, once for a weekend in San Francisco and another for a week in Europe. If she missed me, her new lifestyle certainly alleviated the pain. The divorce was finalized a few months after my conversation with Teresa on the doorstep and without any particular difficulties. The financial aspects were quite simple. Since I was initially living in a rental property, I had to give her some money for the furniture we owned. But other than that, everything went pretty smoothly. Each of us received half of our savings, our clothes, and other personal items. She took her car. I took mine. Despite the fact that I was the one who initiated the divorce, I could not shake the oppressive feeling that it was insanely easy to end a marriage that, as we promised, would last until death. And while I was already having a hard time adjusting, I was surprised at how empty I felt when we finally signed for the divorce papers and I watched Megan walk out of the lawyer's office, no longer my wife. I was staring into space, thinking about how strange and sadly surreal and clinical the divorce process was when I heard Taylor clear his throat. I looked at him and saw a worried look. Are you okay? He asked. Yes, I'm fine. But what? Well you don't look normal. You see, it was a hard day, the end of something that I thought was good and that I thought would last forever. Hard to swallow. I shook my head slowly, trying to keep my emotions under control. Do you have doubts that the separation was the right decision? Taylor asked. I don't think so, no. She absolutely betrayed me by dating Palmer, so I wanted to leave. I wanted to get a divorce, even though I knew it would hurt, I thought for a minute but I guess I wanted her to pay some price. After all, it was she who destroyed our marriage. It must be painful for her. But here I am, barely able to function, so upset, and she leaves here for her boyfriend and just moves on. I guess I want her to feel regret too. I want to hear from her that she screwed up and that I'm the better man or something like that. I want her to be as unhappy as I am now. Taylor listened attentively nodding sympathetically at my words. He seemed to want to say something, 
but I had the feeling that he was debating whether he should do it or not. Finally, he cleared his throat and spoke carefully. Look, I've seen a lot of broken marriages and a lot of ex-husbands and ex-wives wanting the same thing you said. They wanted their exes to suffer because of what they did. They wanted them to see the light, to understand that they had ruined their lives, and they would have received satisfaction from the fact that they would crawl on their knees and begin to cry about how unhappy they had become, and how sorry they were, and how they would like to change what they did. He looked at me intently, his gaze indicating that he needed my full attention. But so here it is. This almost never happens. And even when it does happen, even when a tearful ex admits in great detail everything she did wrong and everything she regrets, this admission does not do much for smart people because they adapted well after the divorce and move it on. They have a new wife, new children, a new house and a new life, and they no longer care about the old life, the old wife and the old grievances. Look, I don't know for sure, but my guess is that someday Megan will greatly regret what she did. But you can't wait for that day. You need to start living in such a way that you don't care what she feels. This is the only way to stay happy. Hell, it's the only way to stay sane. I didn't take Taylor's advice at first, although I thought about it a lot in the weeks that followed as I stumbled through life, trying to come to terms with the huge, gaping, emotional wound Megan had left me with. This wound demanded my attention, reminding me of my loneliness, her betrayal, and my obvious failure as a husband and a man. At her best, she was like a tethered wolf, growling to get my attention and threatening to overwhelm me if I let her get free. At its worst, it was like a fatal injury, causing unbearable and constant pain until it consumed me completely. At work, I was practically inaccessible, wrote programs in silence, and never spoke or smiled at my colleagues. When I was with friends, I moped, almost aggressively, and brought a dark, unhappy cloud of uncomfortable gloom into their homes. When alone, I would stare at the TV, at the words in a book, or at the ceiling, expecting the hour hand on the clock to magically bring me closer to something resembling happiness. And I slept only after I cried. This went on for several weeks, maybe even months. I wanted to take Taylor's advice. I wanted to stop thinking about Megan and just be happy. I wanted to have a new wife, house, child, and dog. I just couldn't figure out how I could achieve this from where I am. I felt like a man without clothes, tools, or even a map, sitting on an ice floe in the middle of the ocean, who just wanted to get home or at least warm up. How to force yourself to become something you are not. Feel what is not there. Ultimately, I think it was my friends who started to break the ice for me. Over time, in their company, I began to enjoy what I did before. Playing games, playing sports, going hiking, going to the movies. They were kind enough to continue to put up with my moods and tried tirelessly to do everything possible to bring me out of my melancholy. And so, every week I talked more, smiled more, and, in the end, laughed more. One night... After we had all eaten dinner and played video games, they all turned on me and insisted that it was time for me to start dating again. In playful fear, I accused them of trying to get rid of me, that they wanted to put me and my problems on some poor, unsuspecting girl. They insisted and gave me an ultimatum, an offer that they correctly thought I could not refuse. They had six tickets for a concert I really wanted to go to. One of the tickets will be mine, provided and only if I can persuade some girl to go with me. Of course, they knew that I might try to trick them into getting into the concert, so there were a few more conditions. She must be unmarried and not related, must be around my age, so I won't be able to invite one of the old widows from work, and she shouldn't take money in exchange for a date, which pretty much ruled out my first plan to ask one of the downtown prostitutes. At work, we have a cute brunette with a good figure who I was a little friendly with and it turned out that she was available and ready to go. I felt awkward at first, but we ended up having a good time. The concert was great, and afterward we went out late that night for a bite to eat and a few drinks, and I even felt comfortable enough to ask her out again. We dated a few more times, had fun, and although we both knew we would never be a couple, 
Spending time with her gave me the courage and boosted my ego to keep trying. Over the next few months, I gradually started going on dates with some frequency, and it didn't take long before I was going on dates almost every weekend. I have found that several girls at work, at the gym I go to, or at parties I attend are more than interested in me. Their attention and interest really made me feel better. Although I actually enjoyed their company, I was unable or perhaps failed to form a serious relationship with any of these women. I got close enough with a couple of them to have sex, which was mostly very good and sometimes even a little wild. But this was purely recreational sex, not the kind that grew out of a desire to become really, truly intimate, the kind that you have with someone to show them how you really feel about them. This kind of sex can only happen with the person you want to marry. All this time I found time to communicate with friends. We were doing normal things, and they were asking me about all my latest dating adventures. Sally and Julie in particular were interested in which of them I really liked and who I was, thinking about getting into a serious relationship with, and were invariably disappointed when I didn't get into a relationship. I figured that sooner or later they would try to take a more active role in getting me into a long-term relationship, so I wasn't particularly surprised when I went to watch the Super Bowl and found, among two other couples, a pretty girl about my age just coming to watch the game. But it was quite obvious that she was my date for the evening. Her name was Leanne. She has light brown hair pulled back into a ponytail, highlighting her cute round face with a slightly upturned nose and a few freckles. She is short, perhaps 30 centimeters shorter than me, and has a slender figure but with the right curves in important places. She has a shy, white-toothed smile and is very easy to talk to. It took me a while to realize that she either really loved football or that she was very well prepared by Bill and Greg because she said the right things at the right times. This made it easy to start a conversation, and it wasn't long before we were talking, arguing, and joking about what was happening on the field. But by the end of the game, the topics of conversation went beyond football, and we started talking about work, about ourselves, and about life in general. She is a nurse who grew up in the area and works at the local hospital, where she met and became friends with Julie, also a nurse. To my surprise, I also learned that she had a boyfriend named Danny, who was one of the accountants at the hospital and was out of town for the weekend. From what she said, I realized that they had been in a pretty serious relationship for quite some time and were essentially engaged. But for a variety of reasons, they both decided they needed to step back and rethink things. She spoke about him calmly, almost impartially, as if trying not to say anything that could arouse her emotions and embarrass her. So, since her relationship was no longer strictly exclusive and she was feeling a little lonely on Super Bowl Sunday, Julie invited her over. This news, of course, took me by surprise, because I assumed that Julie and Sally would try to set me up with very available women. When she left after the game, the women began the inevitable questions about what I thought and whether I would invite her again, and I started talking about her having a boyfriend. Julie tried to explain. Well, like Leanne said, things were pretty serious between them for a while, but that's not the case anymore, and they both date other people from time to time. But she still has a boyfriend, and she made it clear that they almost got married. There is a very big difference between almost married and married, Sally answered categorically. What about almost being married and completely free? This is also a very big difference, I shot back. Julie snorted. Come on, she's not almost married now. This was a few months ago, and frankly, I think that ship has already sailed. How can you know this? If it were all over, she would have said so. And to be honest, I really don't want to get into a relationship with a girl who is one step ahead or on the sidelines of a serious relationship. I think this is a bad idea. Julie raised an eyebrow. You looked like you had a good time. This couldn't be such a bad idea. Obviously, I had a great time but that's part of the problem. I thought for a moment and then continued, trying to be careful not to hurt their feelings too much with what I was about to say. I just don't want to get burned right now. Seriously, I really appreciate you trying to set me up like this, but I just don't understand why you thought this would be a good idea for me. 
Julie had a thoughtful, slightly surprised look. We didn't set you up, I laughed. Come on, three pairs. Great introduction. There is nowhere to sit except next to her. Don't try to deceive me. It was an obvious setup. I repeat, Matt, we didn't set you up. Julie paused and looked at me intently. We set her up. A. I answered as eloquently as possible. Julie smiled. Listen, Matt, you've been dating great for months now, and I'm sure it won't be long until the right girl comes along for something more serious. You don't need our help, but she, on the contrary, needs a really good guy. She paused again, unsure whether to continue. Matt, the truth is that her relationship with Danny has become more than toxic, but she just can't get over him. She needs someone like you to help her get out. I was stunned by Julie's words. I still felt like a fledgling trying to take wing in the dating world, so the idea that Julie and Sally thought I was doing great took me by surprise. Also, given my recent experiences, I didn't like the idea of playing the role of the other man to a woman who was still in her relationship. Do I really want to get a girl from another guy? Do I want to be a watered-down version of that asshole Palmer? The decision would have been simple if I hadn't had a great time with her, but I had a good time, and I couldn't help but think that, apart from a guy, she had everything I wanted. As a result, all evening and the whole next day at work I was thinking, should I call her or not call her? By Monday evening, I decided that nothing bad would happen if I cautiously reached out to see what would happen. It took a little time to work up the courage. But eventually I called her and asked her out for dinner and maybe a dance on Friday night. She seemed glad I called, but when I asked about Friday she sounded disappointed, saying she already had plans. I assumed it was a refusal and tried to gracefully exit the conversation, but she quickly replied that she was free on Saturday and hoped that everything would work out. And so it happened. I wanted to get to know her better and decided it would be better if we had plenty of opportunities to talk so I invited her to a nice, quiet Italian restaurant. Everything was wonderful. She liked the food, and we spent so much time talking that we sat there almost until the place closed. I promised some dancing, but by then it was so late that we bought hot cocoa and went for a cool walk along the lakefront in the center of town. We stopped for a minute under a lamp in one of the small parks, talked and looked at the water. The snow fell softly and settled on her hair. Her cheeks were flushed from the cold, and her freezing breath escaped from her pink lips in lazy clouds as she spoke. At that moment, it seemed to me that I was in some kind of fantastic snow globe, in a winter paradise in the company of an angel. Her breathing, voice, and atmosphere gradually led my gaze to settle on her moving lips, and when I couldn't stop staring, she smiled and tilted her head forward slightly in anticipation. Leaning down, I kissed her tenderly, and then more deeply and gradually wrapped my arms around her as she pressed herself against me. The cold and the social atmosphere limited the duration of our kiss, but the effect was deep and dramatic. The kiss was not and could not be a prelude to any sexual contact, but it was powerful in what it seemed to say, reflecting the growing feelings that I had for her and that she might be beginning to feel for me. We walked along the shore of the lake for some more time, holding hands and talking a little more timidly, walking a little slower and a little closer to each other. For me, this evening was almost perfect, but eventually it was destined to end, and I took her back to her apartment. I promised myself that, given her situation with Danny, I wouldn't pressure her for anything more than a good night kiss, so when she didn't invite me in, I might have been a little disappointed, but I wasn't began to press. We parted with a kiss and a promise to meet again when she was free. I knew I'd have to work around Danny, but suddenly I didn't mind sharing the girl, at least for a while. During the week I corresponded with her and even spoke on the phone a couple of times. She had plans again on Friday but said she could clear her schedule for another date on Saturday. It turned out that the only thing that disappointed her about our first date was that we missed out on going to the dance so I made sure that happened. Our dance date picked up pretty much right where we left off the week before. We sat and talked through about half the fast songs but hardly skipped the slow ones, 
dancing close and so comfortable that it seemed like we had been together for a long, long time. But as good as I felt about her, it struck me that I had felt this way before, and I was a little worried that if I did fall in love with her, I would be extremely vulnerable to more heartache. I wanted to be with her, but I had to protect myself. I warned myself that I could not give myself to my feelings and to her until I was sure that she would give herself to me. I didn't want to expose my newly healed wounds to more emotional trauma. When I dropped her off at home, she invited me out for coffee, and we talked for about half an hour before we started kissing. After a few minutes of kissing, things became very, very warm. The kisses became more desperate, and I began to run my hands over her ass, pulling her closer to me. This led to my hand sliding under her blouse to feel her full breasts, soft and smooth, with a hardening bud in the center. At that moment, she began to breathe heavily, and one of her hands slid to my crotch, pushing and rubbing me through my pants. And now my selfless promise to take my time was overwhelmed by my desire for her. My hand slid from her chest to the waistband of her trousers, and below, feeling the edge of her panties, I looked into her eyes and saw that she wanted me and that she would not make any effort to stop me. But I also saw a hint of fear, a slight worry, and I was suddenly reminded that I had entered very dangerous territory. Despite my pounding heart and poorly controlled lust, I abruptly pulled my hand out of her pants and pulled away from her. Leanne, I... I guess I should go. There was a strange combination of disappointment and relief in her gaze. Why, Matt? Is there something wrong? Listen, I don't think I can control myself, and things are moving fast right now. Faster than it should be. I think maybe we should slow down. Her slow smile spread across her face, and then she laughed. Isn't that the kind of thing a girl should say? Are we playing a role reversal game? Should I tell you that everything will be fine, and that in the morning, I will not stop respecting you? This made me laugh. I guess most guys don't give up that kind of thing very often, do they? She continued to smile. No, unless they are gay. You're not gay, are you, Matt? She laughed again. No, Leanne, I'm not gay, and I think the bulge in my pants should be evidence number one against this idea. I smiled, but I could see that she needed some explanation, some idea of what I was getting at. I bit my lip, trying to find the right words to explain my situation. That's the problem for me. I don't think I... I couldn't think of a way to finish, so she tried to help. Do you think you're not yet ready for sex after a divorce? Is that all, Matt? No, no, I had a lot of sex. That's not the point. I suddenly stopped because she frowned. I obviously said something wrong. I started babbling something, trying to correct my mistake. Wait, that didn't sound right? What I meant to say is that I've had sex with several girls. Recreational sex, meaningless sex, since I started dating. But I don't think I can do this to you. I can't have casual sex with you because my feelings are not casual. I was red from embarrassment, both from how awkwardly I had described my recent sexual activity and from having further revealed my feelings for her. I looked at her seriously, hoping she would understand what I wanted to say and hoping I wouldn't have to say more. She stopped frowning, but she still looked puzzled. Are you afraid to have a relationship with me? Have something not random? This is all. I shook my head slowly. She still didn't quite understand. That's not entirely the point, no. It's hard to convey what I feel. Now I spoke deliberately, choosing my words carefully. I really want to be with you, in every sense and all the time. I want this desperately, but I know that because of your situation with Danny, it can't happen right now. I understand it. Understand. But the way I feel about you, sex with you, will mean a commitment on my part. I wouldn't... I can't make love to you just like that. It has to be in the context of commitment. This can only happen if I can devote myself to you, and this can only happen if you reach a point where you can devote yourself to me. Is it clear? Do you understand where I'm going with this? Now she smiled, broadly, sincerely. She cupped my face with her hands, pulled me towards her and gave me a long, romantic kiss. I think I understand, Matt. 
Sex with me would be an expression of love and a promise of fidelity. And you can't do it right now because I can't make that promise. It's like that? I took a deep breath, feeling relieved. Exactly, Leanne, exactly. Over the next few months, I saw Leanne as often as I could, splitting my time between her days and nights with Danny. We felt very good, and we were getting closer. Deep down, I knew I was playing with emotional fire and risking heartbreak again, but I was happier than I had been in a long, long time. It might have been smarter to back off until she was done with Danny, but at that moment I couldn't bring myself to even consider that option. All was well until July when the three-day weekend, including the fourth, approached. We didn't have any formal plans, but we talked and I assumed we'd meet again. I called her several times over the course of the week to talk and agreed that we would take things according to circumstances over the coming weekend. But on Friday afternoon I called her to find out what time I could pick her up and immediately realized that our plans to meet were in jeopardy. She hesitated for a long time when I asked what she wanted to do, and it was obvious that she had bad news that she did not want to share. When she finally said them, I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. The night before, Danny had surprised her with an invitation to go to Vegas. They left for the weekend immediately after work and returned only late on Monday evening. She tried to calm me down, and I tried to be kind, but I'm sure that a little bitterness still came out. How can you not be at least a little obnoxious when the woman you're in love with announces she's going away for the weekend for a few days with another guy? It was a bad weekend for me, and I tried to pass the time by spending it with friends, but I was mostly an emotional zombie, and I felt like my life was just falling apart again. I felt lonely and abandoned, with the feeling that things would never get better. I imagined what they were doing, gambling, having dinner, walking hand in hand, having sex, getting closer. The images I created corroded me and turned my gloomy mood into midnight blackness. On Saturday night, I had a dream. I was in a hotel in Las Vegas, walking down a hallway identical to the one in Gabriel's mansion, with rooms on either side. I opened several doors looking for Leanne, but couldn't find her. Approaching the last door, I heard the sounds of sex, moans, muttering, gentle slurping sounds, and with a trembling hand, I turned the handle and went inside. I was struck by a vision that I had seen before. The woman, her sweaty back to me, sits on top of the man, riding him smoothly and enthusiastically, her hair wildly draping his face as she leans in to kiss him. The light turned on and she rolled off it. It was Leanne, and she was straddling Danny, but he looked like Palmer. She smiled at me and laughed. Sorry, Matt, but you're just not good enough to satisfy a woman on your own. She turned back to Danny, my heart broke, and I woke up, sweating and panting like a panting dog in summer. On Sunday morning, as I stared at my bedroom ceiling, I reluctantly realized that trying to woo Leanne was making me almost as miserable as I had been during the divorce. I have to stop the bleeding and move on. I couldn't afford the emotional price I knew I'd pay if I allowed myself to fall completely in love with a E woman, only to lose her again to another man. If I cannot control her feelings and actions, then at least I can control my actions. I had to put a tourniquet on this relationship. She called me late Monday night when she got back, but I didn't answer then or when she called several times on Tuesday. I probably acted like a coward because I didn't want to tell her about my decision. But on Wednesday, I forced myself to talk to her. Hey, Matt. I tried to call you. Is everything okay? I was careful and circumspect in my responses. Yes, everything is fine. How was Vegas? She didn't answer right away, and I suspected she was formulating an appropriate response, something truthful that wouldn't hurt me too much. It was fun. A little gambling, dinner, went to a couple of shows and everything. Although not the best time of year to travel to Vegas, it was really hot. The conversation continued, but I was not very talkative. I guess she was waiting for something, maybe an invitation to meet, but I didn't offer it. Finally, she asked when we could meet for a date or just spend time together. I took a deep breath. Well, Leanne, I don't even know. I think it would be nice if we stepped back a little from each other. Maybe let's give each other some space. 
I heard her sigh quietly over the phone. Her voice trembled slightly. Why, Matt? Leanne, listen. I don't think I feel comfortable if we keep this up. I really had a shitty weekend, and the truth is I just don't think I can handle much of that at this point in my life. I've had a lot of heartache over the past few years, and I wish I could do without it. I heard sniffling and a slight cough. It's clear. So you're just mad at me for going to Vegas? Sorry this was last minute. I didn't know what to do. Danny already bought the tickets, and I... Leanne, it's not just that you went away for the weekend, I interrupted her. The thing is, this trip finally made the reality of your relationship with Danny clearer to me. I think I was cheating myself by ignoring the fact that you are in a pretty intense relationship with another guy, intense enough to fly away for a weekend getaway. And now, I'm not fooling myself, I continued. I guess I thought you were in a relationship that was fading, something casual enough that I could live with. But looking back on the last few weeks and this trip, I see that this is not the case. I see that both of you are making quite a lot of effort to try to move forward. And that's great. That's great. I'm in no position to complain because I knew about it when we first started dating and went into it with my eyes open. You didn't hide anything or lie. But still, I think that maybe I've got it all wrong. And I'm finding that being the other guy isn't very good for me right now. So I have to back off. Think about it, Leanne. Maybe it will be good for you, too. You won't have to juggle your schedule or come up with excuses, and I won't be some kind of obstacle between you and Danny. She listened to me, letting me speak, breathing unevenly, as if she was trying to suppress sobs. Finally, when I stopped, she spoke. Is that what you think? That you are some kind of obstacle? That you were just some other guy that I used for fun or something? When we were together, what did I do to give you that impression? I don't know, Leanne. I don't know what you think about me or us. So please tell me who exactly am I to you? Because honestly, I can't understand it. She began to cry. I was trying to find out, Matt. I, I thought we were trying to figure out who we were, what we can become. My heart sank because she sounded so upset. But I reminded myself what this conversation was supposed to be about and repeated my version. Look, I'm not trying to be a jerk or give you an ultimatum or make you feel bad, but I can't keep doing this right now. Like I said, I think it would be better for both of us to simplify what's going on, and in reality, that means you and I need to step away from each other. If we do this, it won't hurt me as much, and you won't have to work next to me while you try to deal with Danny. Leanne whimpered some more. I guess I didn't know you were in so much pain, Matt. But I was. And there is, I thought, saying goodbye and hanging up. Over the next few weeks, I tried my best to immerse myself in work. I had another fairly important task that required a lot of time and concentration, and I was grateful for the distractions. This helped the days pass a little more calmly, and the late returns home made the nights a little shorter. On weekends, I would go to my friends' houses to hang out with them and try not to be Mr. Gloomy. Julie and Sally were sympathetic to me, although they did not give me peace at first. Julie felt that I shouldn't give up, that if I waited, her relationship with Danny would almost certainly fail, and we would end up being perfect for each other. I expressed my doubts that she would be able to forget Danny anytime soon or ever. I made it clear that it was very difficult for me to stay away from her and that I had no resentment toward her, but that I simply could not pay the emotional price of continuing to pursue her. I remember Julie saying, the price of regret is also quite high. And so it all happened again. Loneliness at night, pain, thinking about the woman I really care about spending her time with another man, trying to drown out the pain by working hard and pretending that when I'm at home, cheering on my favorite baseball team and playing video games is enough to make me happy. I was miserable. One evening, about a month after this, I was awakened from my dead sleep by the sound of a mobile phone. I looked at my watch, saw that it was already two in the morning, and without answering, I went to bed. But I started to think that at a time like this, it could be something very important. Maybe my mom or dad was sick or something like that, so I picked up the phone and saw that I had received a text message. 
It was from Leanne and was very simple. I miss you so much. I probably stared at those words for about 20 minutes, thinking about her, wondering what she was doing and why she was writing to me now in the middle of the night. I imagined that she had had a rough night and that she must really need a friend. Suddenly, this self-exile became meaningless to me. I'm lonely, unhappy, and obsessed with her. And she wants to be with me so much that she sent this SMS at this hour. She didn't betray me, just couldn't give me the reassurance I needed as I allowed myself to become even more attached to her. And I wrote back to her, I miss you too. The next day I called her, and after a few awkward moments we talked as if nothing had happened. We talked and texted for a week, and eventually I asked her out to dinner. This led to more dates and more time together, and soon we were spending several nights a week with each other. She was still dating Danny, but her dates with him were becoming very sporadic, and a couple of times she turned down dates with him to be with me. By this time it was mid-September, and we had a Friday night date, dinner, and one last outdoor concert before the summer faded completely. After the concert, we walked through the park, holding hands, talking, laughing, and kissing. Somewhere around midnight, we went to a late-night coffee shop and ordered dessert, holding hands at the table, unable to take our eyes off each other. The conversation did not stop for a second. Eventually, it got so late that the date had to end, but neither of us wanted to say goodbye. I desperately wanted to take her home, but I knew that if I did, we would almost certainly end up in bed together, and without a firm commitment on her part to be exclusive, I felt it would be a mistake to make myself too vulnerable. She was disappointed when I said I'd better take her home, but made me swear that we'd see each other later in the day since it was already early Saturday morning. It wasn't hard to promise. Leanne took the earliest opportunity to make good on my promise showing up unexpectedly around eight in the morning, laughing at me when I answered the door in an old robe, unshaven and unkempt, and announcing that she was going to start the day right. She said she wanted to show off her cooking skills, and while I showered and shaved, she cooked a couple of omelets and scrambled eggs. Over breakfast, we chatted animatedly and playfully argued about what we should do that morning. We finally decided to visit the planetarium and spent the morning and part of the afternoon watching presentations about the stars and planets. Around mid-afternoon, we grabbed a bite to eat at a nearby sandwich shop and then took a short walk in the nearby park. The conversation dragged on a little, and in the silence I saw Leanne biting her lip, contemplating something she clearly wanted to say. Her hesitation bothered me, because I didn't want to hear anything complicated. Matt... I need to tell you something, she began. Do I want to hear this? I gasped. She looked thoughtful. Some of it probably isn't. But I think I should tell you about... She stopped, obviously trying to find the right words. My heart was beating a million miles an hour. She started again. Look, Matt, you never asked about what I do with Danny during our dates, you know, physically and I appreciate it. It was polite, and it would have been, actually, quite awkward to talk about. But I want you to know that we didn't sleep together often, maybe once or twice a month, no more, since we started dating. Hearing her talk about sleeping with Danny, even if it wasn't often hurt, but I could breath the easier now. I didn't want to hear that she had sex with Danny, but what she said was much easier to hear than what I was most worried about that she had decided to only be with Danny. Now she was looking straight at me, her eyes meeting mine. The other thing is that the last couple of times, even before Vegas, I really felt like I was cheating, that I shouldn't be in bed with him, I shouldn't do this to you. That night, that night when I wrote to you, Danny was very persistent, and I just couldn't do it, I had to say no. He got a little angry, I asked him to leave, and he left, but he was very upset. All I could think about was how much I wanted you to be there, to hold me and make everything better. I wanted to be with you, and even if I couldn't, I wasn't going to cheat on you. Now it has become easier for me to breathe. Her confession came as a relief to me, and, as if by magic, my mood improved. I smiled and even felt a little lightheaded. Matt, one more thing, and I know it's none of my business. She paused, 
biting her bottom lip in uncertainty, and looked like she wanted me to save her or something. It's stupid, but I had no idea what she was trying to say. What? That's all I could say. She blushed and continued. I know that you had a lot of girlfriends before me, and I would like to know if, well, since we've been dating, you have a girlfriend. Now I get it. But the sneaky part of me wanted her to squirm a little. She's cute when she squirms. What do I have? I asked, trying but failing to keep a straight face. I found myself grinning, having a hard time not laughing. She realized that I was mocking her and playfully hit her on the shoulder. I can't believe you're going to make me ask you. She raised her eyebrows and her eyes glared into mine. Okay, Matt, did you have a lot of sex? As she waited for an answer, her face softened into an expression of confusion, hope, fear, and perhaps curiosity. Oh, yeah, I guess I'll say I did. Quite a lot, actually. Her face darkened, and I quickly added, Of course, every time I was alone. I pointed with my eyes at my right hand, bending and unbending it a couple of times. A look of understanding and relief appeared on her face, and she laughed lightly. She took my right hand and, looking at it, said, I think I should envy you, because you have already almost completely taken possession of my mat. I sucked in a breath and made an expression of discomfort on my face, pretending that it was difficult for me to say something. Leanne, it wasn't just the right hand there. I don't know how to tell you, but I was also left-handed. Sorry, I just couldn't help myself. She laughed again hugged me and, kissing me tenderly after each word, said, From this moment, your hands will touch me and not you. She ended with a long, sensual French kiss. I wanted to say something incredibly erotic and romantic. I wanted to amaze her with the depth of my feelings and give her something that she would remember forever. I wanted to be Keats, Don Juan, and Cyrano de Bergerac rolled into one. But at that moment, all I could say was, how about you come to my place? She was still breathing heavily, looking at me with loving eyes and hugging me as if she didn't want to let go. But then she said something that I didn't expect at all. How about I meet you there in a couple of hours? I have to take care of something first. I was more than a little surprised and more than a little disheartened. I asked what she needed to do, where she was going, and why she couldn't do it later. But she was coy, and given my recent track record, I was more than a little concerned. We walked to my car, and I drove her to her house. She ran to her car, got in and drove away without going into the apartment, driving as if she had been shot with a gun. Her sudden departure had me thinking a million miles an hour. Naturally, I imagined that she had something more important than being with me, and I felt pretty lousy about it. In ten minutes, I went from being sure that she wanted to be with me to not being sure about anything. I went home, grabbed a beer, collapsed on the couch, and started watching some old movie. Two more beers, a ham sandwich, another old movie, and I was sure I'd be spending another night alone when my front door slammed open. It was so loud and unexpected that I jumped up from the couch, thinking it was the police or something worse. Leanne burst into the living room, hugged me and kissed me deeply. Missed you, she said, and started rummaging through her purse, eventually pulling out a huge pack of condoms, which she threw on the coffee table, and kissed me again. Why are there so many condoms? I muttered, still pressing my lips to hers. She pulled back a little and blushed. I didn't want to risk that you'd want to use them and you wouldn't have them, so I took a few. So you spent three hours buying condoms, is this what you did? She looked at my chest, grabbed my shirt, and began to slowly unbutton the buttons as she spoke. No, I went to Danny. She raised her eyes to my face as she said this, undoubtedly seeing an expression of extreme consternation. It's not what you might think. I had to tell him it was over. We'd been together a long time, Matt, and I didn't want to do this over the phone. He deserved a face-to-face -face conversation. Otherwise, it would become cowardice. I was relieved, but still puzzled. Did you need to do this tonight? Yes, Matt. It was necessary. And I did it for you. For us. 
She was finishing taking off my shirt, looking at me intently, her mouth inches from mine, her breath mingling with mine as she spoke. Remember when you told me you couldn't have sex with me for fun? That your feelings are too strong to do this and that you want sex to reflect commitment? To reflect loyalty? Exceptionalism? I nodded. Shh, well, so it will be. So it will be. And I had to officially end things with Danny for that to happen. My shirt was off and she was kissing my chest. Between her kisses and her hasty explanation that carried some of the life-changing implications of our relationship, I found it hard to think. So, uh, that would mean that... I couldn't say anything else. That would mean that I want you to be the last man I make love to. She looked at me and raised her eyebrows. And it would certainly be better if that meant that I would be the last woman you would be with. By this time, my pants were halfway down my legs, and she reached for my manhood and began caressing it with long, sensual, luxurious strokes. All I could do was smile, nod dumbly, and reach for her blouse. A few minutes later, we were in bed, naked, kissing and caressing each other with some desperate desire and anxiety. I kissed her neck, chest, stomach, thighs, legs, and then began to move up again, stopping at her crotch where I spent some time blowing, caressing, and kissing. It didn't take long before she moaned and then nearly screamed, her hips bucking against my face like a rodeo horse. I continued to press my mouth against her until her hips slowed and then stopped, and I crawled towards her to level my face with hers, kissing her cheeks, neck, and shoulders, avoiding her mouth in case she didn't want to try herself. She didn't want any of this, she pulled my face towards hers, and we started kissing deeply again. Then I needed her more than ever in my life, and I slowly took her. Then our pace accelerated. It wasn't the kind of sex that people do for pleasure. We did what lovers do, what couples do, fenced off from the entire outside world, when they want to be with only one person, when they almost want to be the only being in the world. I wanted it to last forever, but when she arched her back again and screamed at me, I followed her. We lay panting, kissing, smiling and giggling over small talk, whispering quiet, I love you, for quite some time. Then we did it two more times, each time with almost as much pleasure as the first, and stayed asleep in bed until late Sunday morning when we did it again. We never used condoms. Over the next few days, Leanne moved into the semi-detached house with me. She placed her clothes where Megan's used to be, as well as her makeup and shoes. We ate together, watched TV together, showered together, and slept. Together. It felt like marriage to me, and after months of being in this relationship, I didn't see the point in not making it official. I asked her to marry me at the same Italian restaurant where we went on our first date, and she responded by throwing herself across the table to hug me, spilling water on the tablecloth and getting red sauce all over her blouse. We went to her parents' house for Thanksgiving so they could meet me. They were obviously a little concerned that Leanne had jumped into another relationship too quickly and were also a little worried about my divorce, but they stopped worrying when they saw us together and after Leanne explained the circumstances of my divorce in a private conversation. I was nervous, but I think I made a pretty good impression, and by the end of the weekend, her family was treating me like an old friend, and her parents were already asking about our plans for kids. Leanne and I didn't delay our engagement and got married in a small village chapel on a crisp, snowy Saturday in February. The wedding was small and intimate, attended by family members and a few close friends. I had a hard time choosing a best man, so Bill and Greg shared the duties with Sister Leanne serving as the bride's best man. Julie and Sally were the bridesmaids and, as expected, they practically took over the wedding preparations, dealing with details that neither Lena nor I particularly cared about. The day after the wedding, we flew to St. Thomas and had a very relaxing and memorable honeymoon. We had such a good time that we promised each other we would return, perhaps for our 10th anniversary. Over the next few years, Leanne and I saved money and eventually bought a house. It was a renovated house with four bedrooms, a beautiful porch, and a large yard with trees and a flower bed. 
The day we closed, Leanne announced she was pregnant, and by the time we had remodeled the entire interior of the house, there was a baby boy in the freshly painted nursery. Our lives changed with the birth of Tommy, but I couldn't be happier. We were becoming the family I had always dreamed of. Shortly after Tommy was born, there was a shootout at Gabriel's house. It turned out that some guy's wife made a scene with one of Gabriel's friends, and he was not as phlegmatic about it as I was. He pulled out a gun and, after shooting Jordy in the leg, walked through the house until he found his wife and her lover, whom he shot before turning the gun on himself. I think his wife survived and Jordy was okay, but the shooter and his lover were both killed. The trial was full of juicy details and, as expected, became big news, even making national headlines. I'm guessing the Putnam family wasn't too happy about the publicity and gave Gabriel an ultimatum, forcing him to sell the mansion and essentially banishing him back to the family compound in Ohio. Around the time of the trial, I was at a party at Bill's house and recognized Charles Taylor and his wife. I came up to say hello, and he remembered me. We talked for a bit, and he seemed genuinely happy with how things had turned out for me. As I was about to leave, he smiled and asked what I thought of Palmer. To be honest, I haven't thought about him for a long time. What do you mean? Um, well, I don't think you heard, but he got divorced. His wife finally left him because of cheating. No, and that's the funniest thing. They had this, uh, open marriage, and I think eventually she got tired of Palmer and fell in love with one of her boyfriends. Anyway, she had an ironclad prenuptial agreement, so Palmer was damn lucky when she left him. So what happened then? Him and Megan? No, I don't think so. He interrupted. He had to leave town to find a job, and I'm sure he left alone. It turned out that he had zero skills as a lawyer, which should not surprise anyone. I think he works nine to five at his brother's hardware store in Pittsburgh. Funny, right? Yes, probably. A bit of a downgrade, huh? Taylor laughed and winked. I remembered what he told me in his office on the day of my divorce and realized how right he was. Things didn't work out between my former Rival and Megan, and while it was interesting, I didn't need to know about it to be happy. I have a family that I care about and love, and that's really all that matters to me. About three years later, I saw Megan again for the last time. It was in a greenhouse nursery. I was with my boy sitting in a cart while I looked at some flowering plants. Leanne, seven months pregnant with our second child, was inspecting the trees on the other side of the nursery. While I pushed the cart along the rows of lavender, Megan stood at the far end of the aisle and looked at a basket of some herbs. She hasn't changed much. Maybe she's gained a little weight, but overall she's remained the same. I saw her first, or at least I thought so, and called out to her. She looked up at me and smiled as I approached, pushing my cart. Hello, Matt. Wow. How many years? How many winters? How are you? Her smile faltered slightly as she looked at me, and she looked more vulnerable than I'd ever seen her. I smiled back and said that she looked great and that I was doing well. She nodded and then turned and smiled at Tommy. Who is this kid? This is my son, Tommy. Tommy, say hello. As usual, he was a little shy and very quietly muttered something that could be taken for a greeting. He's a sweet little boy, she said, smiling. How are you, Matt? What are you doing? We started talking about gardening and then found out how life goes in general. She still works at the same job, earning almost the same salary. She's not dating anyone seriously and hasn't been for a while. I wasn't entirely sure, but from the way she spoke, I got the impression that her relationship with Palmer had ended long before he had to leave town. She mentioned that Teresa married Stuart, but apparently the mutual commitment didn't work out and they divorced a year later. Teresa moved in with Megan after that, but they eventually stopped getting along and she moved out a few months later. Now, Megan lives alone in a small apartment in the city center where there is not much greenery. She said she was buying herbs to plant in a little window box and was jealous of the big garden I was planting. When we finished talking, Leanne appeared and I introduced her. We chatted for a couple more minutes and then said goodbye. Leanne and I finished our shopping and walked to the car. 
but as usual, Leanne forgot something and ran back to the store while I drove the car to the exit. A few minutes later, Leanne came out looking slightly worried. I asked if she was upset about anything, but she quickly smiled and shook her head, saying she was just trying to make sure we didn't forget anything else. We returned home and spent a typical spring day gardening and fooling around. In the end, Tommy, Leanne, and I sat on the porch swing, drinking lemonade, smelling lilacs, and listening to the sounds of the neighbors. Leanne broke the silence. So what were you and Megan talking about before I came over? Nothing, just about gardening and stuff. I really had nothing to say. It was a little awkward, really. You didn't say anything bad? Of course not. Why are you asking? I was puzzled. Because when she returned to the store, she stood in the same aisle and cried. I had to walk around her so she wouldn't see me. She looked very upset. I shrugged my shoulders in response because I didn't know what to say to this. But when I thought about it, I remembered all the plans Megan and I made when we got married. Plans to have a house with a garden and trees, an unbreakable relationship and a close, loving family. And I thought I might understand why our conversation had upset her so much. I remembered what Charles Taylor told me years ago about moving on so that I wouldn't care if Megan regretted her choice. In the end, I followed this advice and it served me well, but it's not entirely accurate that I didn't care at all how things turned out for her. I moved on and loved my life, my wife, my son, and my home. But as I looked from the porch onto the front lawn, hugging Leanne, holding Tommy in my lap, and smelling the lilacs, I knew what Megan was missing, and I knew that she knew what it was, too. I don't think a truly caring and benevolent person would take pleasure in another's misfortune. But I couldn't help it. Megan traded gold for plastic, threw away her dreams for short-term pleasure, and could not get them back. I pulled Leanne closer to me and smiled. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you, and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.